Welcome to The IntraZone, a show about the Microsoft 365 Intelligent Intranet. I'm Mark Cashman, here with my co-host, Chris, the guy who just keeps trucking along, McNulty. Well, thanks, Mark. So today's episode is all about education. In fact, it's education about education. I hope, See what I, did I hope it's educational. This is a great topic because I don't know if you realize this, but my first job out of school was not product management. <laughs> um, I was a grade school music teacher. Really? What was your primary instrument? I can guess piano of the of what I, I know pi- about you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm a piano player by trade, but I rapidly discovered that if you want second graders to get up out of their seats, turn your back to them while you play the <laughs> piano. So I rapidly got good at guitar. It's really hard for me to kind of map what it would have been like to have had all the advantages that we have with Microsoft Teams and being able to use that to kind of shape the classroom experience, the educator experience, the parent experience. But it's just amazing that there's so much technology. Like, my daughter is a dancer with Pacific Northwest Ballet and Boston Ballet. And so we get to do classroom observations, and so we were over here at Pacific Northwest, and I was watching how her teacher runs the entire class for a mobile app. Like, really? all of the music, all the de- like, everything is all cued. And it's just astonishing, like, that, you know, there are things which seem to have lingered a long time, like chalkboards or maybe whiteboards, and it's just, everything's going so digital these days. Well, I've noticed also that, you know, the old moniker about the homework, you know, the dog ate my homework. Mm-hmm then evolved into the dog ate my thumb drive. Now it's a little bit harder to sell. You know, the dog is up in the clouds making it rain or God knows what. You know, it it is truly moved to digital. And I, I actually see it with my own children as they're turning their assignments via OneDrive. You know, not to just push OneDrive, but that's the reality of how the teacher expects them to turn it in. The way that they can turn it in, you know, it really has evolved. But I think through this episode, you're going to see – uh, focus on the different personas, teachers, yep. students, and certainly for parents, and how that has all changed for them and how we support it. So today, we're going to be speaking with Dominic Williamson, who works as the education product manager for Microsoft Teams, and Deb Johnny Mitra, who is the program manager for Portals on the SharePoint team. And it's great to get Microsoft's perspective, but the part of today's podcast I really want to recommend both to our listeners as well as to the rest of Microsoft, is getting to sit down with our customer, with Alexander and Mats at the Stockholm City Schools. I don't think it's a surprise that Microsoft is in a competitive posture in education. And we know that if we can engage students to be able to learn more and achieve more with our technology, the likelihood of their continuing those patterns forward is just much greater. But The other thing that I'm really mindful of is how does the work that we do with education benefit our non-education customer base? We know that improving the skill sets of a company workforce is a really important thing. And so when we look at things like LinkedIn learning and how do, you know, how not just do we educate people about our products, but how does an organization keep their workforce moving forward and use the tools and patterns that we've helped carry forward in the education space, I think there's a benefit for everyone. So, Mark, since my job history only includes one year as a school teacher, I think (laughs) it's best for everyone if I stop talking about education. Are you saying we should hear from some other people? We should actually open this discussion up for more. So coming up next is our discussion with Dominic Williamson and to Johnny Mitra from our SharePoint and Teams education teams. So let's turn our attention now to actually talk to some folks that know way more about education than me. But let's talk about what we do for others when it comes to education. So we're here to talk to Dominic Williamson, who is on the Microsoft Teams for Education team, product manager. Yes, I am. And Debjani Mitra, who is on the SharePoint team, your program manager. That's right. Welcome both to the IntraZone. Thanks for having us. Uh, So before we dive in, Let's just go maybe start with Deb Johnny, share a little bit more who you are, what you do specifically on the SharePoint team. 
Great. It's a pleasure to be here. So I am a program manager on the SharePoint Experiences team. And in the core product, I own a number of features in our portals and publishing space. Uh, I am also the PM that drives our efforts in the education market segment. So in this role, I partner with the Microsoft EDU team. And I also work with colleagues in other office products that are looking at education. Um, you know, Microsoft Education tries to be super customer obsessed. Everything we build comes directly to us from educational institutions, teachers and students. So in my role, I have the pleasure of talking to lots of people, um, you know, that are either in IT or communications in schools and colleges, lots of teachers and students. These are always great, insightful experiences. And uh, I don't know if I can express it strongly enough, but this part of my job is the one that I love the most. I hear it coming through, and I think everybody, the energy, the buzz that just went from Mark to Deb Johnny, <laughs> I, think they'll, I think that will come through. Dominic, what is your focus? When we say Teams for Education, what's your role there? How did you get there? All that good stuff. So Teams for Education, my role is actually not focused on a feature, but it's how is Teams being used by our customers around the world. And specifically, then I focus on how is it being used by school districts, colleges, and universities across the use cases, such as classroom collaboration, research, thinking about also how do we just save time running a school district, running a university. And so that's what my role is. I work every single day with customers around the world to understand the use cases and also to help them adopt Teams. And then ultimately, how can we make Teams even better for the next time they come to use Teams in that course collaboration or whatever it might be? You know, that's what I'm super interested in. And one of the fun things about my role is I actually get to see firsthand, you know, the impact it can have on a student when we think about a more inclusive classroom and maybe them getting to learn something in a way that that might not have been possible before if we think about how, you know, maybe pen and paper might not have been the right modality for them in the past to learn a concept. And so it's super exciting to see the impact that we can have when we create a product like Teams for Education. I love this. You guys are filling the room with energy, and it's all for the students and the teachers. When we think about education either as a vertical or their special needs from the state, city, across all the schools, all the grade levels, and everybody involved, st teachers, students, administrations, and, of course, parents, um, how does that all come together in what Teams has to offer for education. Yeah, well, it's very much, I, I love to say, modern Microsoft. You know, we're really thinking about how do we enhance our products for our end users, for our customers, and really listen to what their needs are. And so that's when you mentioned Teams for Education. We actually have made an investment within the Teams product group to have a specialized set of enhancements for our education customers. And so well, what are those? So things like having an assignment service, really having deep integration around the scenarios where we see Teams being used. So, for example, classes, professional learning communities, staff departments, this is where we've actually enhanced Teams to really make sure it has capabilities like the OneNote class notebook, like the OneNote staff notebook to support educators. And it's a big thing that we've heard in the past where it's like, you know, Microsoft, it's a powerful enterprise tool, but how can I use it in my classroom? How can I use it in my professional learning community? And so this is really where we've enhanced Teams. And we've also actually done some great work on the user interface recently based, again, directly on feedback from our customers who are teachers, who are students, to then also streamline it. And I'll happily share a few more details about that a well, little later on. Well, you, you had mentioned a word earlier that I, I love to hear when we use it in lots of different contexts. And I think this one you'd used was inclusion. Mm -hmm. And being an inclusive environment just for the school itself, obviously that starts there, whether it's pen and paper or digital. When it comes to the access to information and how people can work together, what does inclusion mean for what Teams then enables? So from an inclusion point of view, it's really thinking about each student, each person is different. And how can we help them to learn in a way that's going to be effective for them? Some students might have different visual requirements, or some students might just have different preferences in the way that they learn. Some like auditory, some like written, some like visual images. And so how can we help to personalize the experience? If you have a classroom of 30 students, if you have a lecture theater of 500 students, there is never going to be the one type of content that will be perfect for everybody. So how can we create a tool flexible like Teams, where, for example, you can then have flipped learning on-demand videos or create more inclusive experiences like with deep integration with the immersive reader. So, you know, me personally, I actually learn better when I hear things spoken. So that's one of the things I do a lot is I click the read aloud button because it really helps me to just learn. And so it's a fantastic capability. So you're, you're really saying that the interzone should go to every student that's using Teams because a podcast will help them learn in an audible fashion. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so if we take that, obviously, as a, as a start to understanding what Teams for Education is, Deb Johnny, similar from a SharePoint perspective, how do we look at what your team and ultimately what is a company we offer to education 
at the grandest level down to what individual students and teachers are doing? I love the framing of that question. So I'll start with this. I think we all know SharePoint is a really multifaceted product. There's a lot of different things that you can do with it. And when I speak with customers, I always find that one school or one university that's doing something super unique, interesting, and really awesome with SharePoint. To give you a couple of examples, there is an assistant principal in a school that's really a power user of Microsoft. She's built a business application on top of SharePoint lists to track student progress over time. Then there is a university I spoke to that's built their full-fledged LMS on top of SharePoint. So these are some great use cases, and I love them. But when I talk to customers, there's two that really stand out as ways that SharePoint is supporting education uh, more, more frequently and uh, in a bigger way and is really aligned with the way we think of SharePoint as part of the larger Microsoft for Education offering. So these are the two ways. The first is that SharePoint is being used as an institution-level landing experiences um, in schools and colleges. So this will be this top-level site that students and teachers and sometimes parents come to to get uh, information from the schools and colleges. Um, the kinds of information here might be important resources like links to you know, forms, links to um, other pieces of information, maybe a third-party learning system. There's internal news. There's also events at the school happening either that day or that week in SharePoint provides this great canvas to have information uh, for events displayed in a dynamic and visually compelling way. Uh, you might also see a Twitter web part there or a countdown timer that's sort of counting down to a... <laughs> when does school get out? Yeah, or like <laughs> the fall dance or something like that, sure, you know? Sure. Um, equally exciting. And... Um, so this this sort of landing portal really brings the community of students, teachers, and parents together and keeps them engaged and informed about the institution. And the second use case is really deeply using that team site that comes with um, a class team or a staff team or a PLC team, really any team um, in the school or the college. So the team files are already stored in the document library of that team site. And, you know, SharePoint has brought the full fidelity functionality of that doclib right into Teams. So students and teachers don't need to leave the context of Teams to get the full benefit of files right in the Teams experience. Now, when I say deeply using that team site, I actually mean more than just the doclib. For example, using that homepage um, to share information and updates with the community of the team. And then pinning that homepage right inside Teams. So again, you can leverage the benefit of of, um, that team site homepage inside the team's experience. It's a great point to focus on that when you are working in the team site and starting to use teams with the team site, there's a lot of features and capabilities that you build out for the group of students, the class, the whatever level. And when you bring that into teams, that's additional functionality. When you think of the list of features that you've shared already, specific to students and teachers, what are some of those you know, now that they're working with files, they've got, you know, a lot of different projects, assignments, whatever the lists and whatever they're tracking, what are some things from a feature perspective that are specific to students and teachers? So within Teams, one of the things that we find particularly powerful is it's the hub for communication and collaboration. And so therefore you have those files that Deb mentioned, but you then also have all of the communication in context of the files. And then when I talk about the hub for collaboration, it's also extending beyond not just Microsoft apps and experiences, but also we've got this third party ecosystem where educators can reuse content from popular platforms like Quizlet, Nearpod, to have this really rich learning environment where it's extending then the capability capabilities and of Office 365 to then having learner content available on demand to help support them, you know, do things like see a 3D model of their digestive system without ever leaving the single view of Teams and really helping students focus on what they might be learning. It could be a science subject um, in that quick example, but that's where we really see Teams coming to life when you think about it as this, almost this ecosystem that's extensible and can genuinely become the hub for the student learning experience. It really is like a new instance of Teams that is just for the them. It's really st set up almost like a template for them to then build off of, but very different than the template that I would use for a project that's not education-based. So I know you talk to a lot of customers, both of you, 
And I know that we're going to be talking, Deb Johnny, to one of your customers later, Stockholm City Schools. And so we're going to get a lot of details from them. But from your perspective, as you started to engage on that project, it had already been going, but they started to loop you in and you gave them some best practices, guidance, or some ideas. What was that like? And, and maybe what was the part that you contributed? So glad we have uh, Stockholm City Schools on this show. I think they're a really good customer to hear from. And what I really love about them is that they've really leaned into modern SharePoint using communication sites, using a number of our out-of-box web parts, um, using our flexible page authoring canvas. So I'm sure they'll tell you lots more, but um, Stockholm City Schools has that um, city-level portal that's you know heavily branded. They've used our out-of-box web parts for things like news and links. Where, where necessary, they've built SPFX web parts. And they've done a really cool thing, which we recommend customers do at all times, is when you have this um, organization-level um, landing experience, have a branded link to that in the suite nav. And they've done it. So now when teachers and students, no matter where they are in the suite, um, you know, want to come back to that top-level site, they just click on that link and they're right there. So they're grounded in this experience, this top-level experience. As we touched upon earlier, they also have school-level uh, news sites from which content rolls up to the institutional um, landing experience. I really think, you know, Stockholm is a great customer of Office 365 across all market segments. And it's so great that they've leveraged SharePoint in this way to really engage their community of students, teachers, and parents. In terms of where we are going from here, they're, you know, big users of Teams as well. Like I mentioned, we want to make uh, a seamless experience for teachers and students so that they don't need to leave the Teams context to achieve things in their classes and staff teams and every other team in school. So we're exploring ways in which I can help guide them there. Um, so we've talked about the unique opportunities and mm -hmm. some of the things that we've done either, either with Stockholm or in general for education customers. Would you say that there's any unique challenges that the education space has opened up for us or for them that um, we've uniquely you know, taken as an opportunity to solve or to at least dig into? Yes, I think the one thing that really stands out to me that separates education from every other market segment is that we need to be really clear about what each product provides um, in terms of scenarios that they are solving. I think in commercial, we can go in and say Office 365 has all of these capabilities. You pick and choose what you want and achieve great things in your workplace. In education, a product needs to be a bit more prescriptive to be successful. And for SharePoint, I believe sort of the two ways in which we can be differentiated and successful as part of the larger M365 suite is by providing sort of that branded top level institutional landing experience that engages and informs the community of students, teachers and parents. Mm -hmm. And also uh, that team home site that I mentioned earlier that can be a canvas for keeping the team looped in and up to date and be available inside Teams. I Bet, like me, you all get the question, what to use when, fill in the blank of what the product is. And specifically with SharePoint and Teams, often, at least I've heard the question, when do I use SharePoint versus Teams? I hope by the end of this, the sub-goal of this episode in the context of education is to be very clear. You, both of you, have not said the same thing about what your each product roles and, and respective offerings provide to education. I haven't heard anybody duplicate what the other features are. Uh, and I think that's just it. It's really SharePoint and Teams coming together along with lots of other yeah, complementing capabilities each other. and complementing each yeah. other and not... Um, providing sort of this confusion, but really balancing out to provide solutions. Um, but specific to Teams, I know one thing that SharePoint really doesn't do is conversations. Mm -hmm. How does the conversations aspect of Teams, which we, we know is really the bread and butter of, of Teams at the heart of it, how do we handle that communications for Teams and maybe specifically some of those um, staff communications. Yeah. So one of the things that's really powerful about Teams, and you mentioned a second ago, you know, you can't have Microsoft Teams without SharePoint from a document collaboration point of view. It's really, you know, the hub that brings those documents together. And so what it also is then leveraging is, of course, all of the audit and compliance that we have as part of the conversation space. So behind the scenes, it's using Exchange mailboxes. And the benefit you have here is you now have this really rich ability to have, you know, interactive conversations, which are also a little bit less formal. And this is where we start to see a genuine, stronger connection 
connection between a teacher and a student. We've actually seen more active learner communities. A great example was at the University of New South Wales in Australia, a lecturer, Dr. Kellerman, he actually had 500 students in his course. And one of the challenges he had in past years was often that they wouldn't really engage from a conversation point in the context of his course. They'd sort of splinter off and use their own sort of, you know, third party social media chat tools. But he never had an active community of all the students learning from one another, asking each other questions. And so what it allowed is when he moved to Teams, it has a fantastic mobile app experience. And so it has push notifications, at mentions, even a little bit of lightheartedness with GIFs. And so this is where he actually saw a 900% increase in student engagement. Wow. Yeah. They were asking each other questions and then answering each other's questions. And of course, it's in the context of Dr. Kellerman's course. So that way, if you know someone gave the wrong piece of information, he could always correct it. But what he did see, and if we look at the science around how do people learn, one of the highest ways you can retain information is if you teach something to someone else. Because if you're teaching someone how to do something, you obviously need to know that content yourself in the first place. And behind the scenes, you know, this is what I mentioned around, we still have those exchange mailbox retention policies. So everything is there correctly stored from a governance compliance point of view. But from an end user point of view, it's in a much more engaging way that can have a real impact when we start to think about students coming together in their course. I, I think that's very important, not only to hear from you, but to know, because we talk about a lot of different industries, you know, healthcare, pharma, you know, certainly in manufacturing, retail, everybody has their own level of what governance means or what their requirements are. And I know for sure from a SharePoint perspective, and I know because the parts and pieces that play into some of where you put uh, things for teams, you know, the files, obviously the conversations follow that same pattern to not break whatever it is, the governance plan that's been put in place. Mm -hmm. But I think it also, you know, has probably very unique requirements that we certainly support when it comes to students and teachers interacting yeah, and just on that set of requirements that you mentioned, you know, that's what we've also done to enhance when we say Teams for Education. When you actually click create a new team, you'll see you've actually got four options. So for anyone who is using Teams and you may be coming from a business or government background, you won't actually see these extra templates designed for education. But this is where you'll actually see an option for a class team type. And one of the things it has, and going back to those requirements that, that tutors, uh, educators will have, is the need to also sometimes moderate conversations, particularly if we think about Teams being used in schools or primary schools. And this is where you have the ability to actually mute a student if you need to, if they're being disruptive in class, or if you need to just help focus student attention back to maybe, you know, you want to kind of guide them on the next task you want them to do. And so we're really making sure it's customizable from the end user's point of view, yourself as an educator, and then of course behind the scenes also then having all of those audit capabilities that you would expect from Office 365. Excellent. So let's turn our attention to the future. Uh, you know, I'm not asking for either of you to disclose anything major unless you want to, uh, but really thinking in terms of how does the SharePoint team from an education level lens. Think about the future. You know, what are some things that we could do to update existing tech, um, some things that we're hearing that we're considering, anything you can share about the future of SharePoint for education? We'd love to. So first of all, we hear from customers a need for clarity between OneDrive, SharePoint, and Teams and how they all relate together. And we're working on addressing that now. We hope to have some public documentation explaining uh, how these technologies relate um, out soon and uh, in the Office EDU Help Center. So that's the first that's coming soon. Um, the second is, you know, we strive to make page authoring and site authoring super great. And uh, we're taking a lot of feedback from education to see how we can tailor those creation experiences um, for this particular market segment. And last, but certainly not the least, we are committed to bringing SharePoint experiences to where people work. And so the SharePoint and Teams orgs are partnering closely to make this possible. You know, we've already brought the full fidelity functionality of that document library into Teams, and this has laid the groundwork for future investment. And so as we you know, go down the path, path of this partnership, uh, EDU is a uh, core market segment that uh, we want to take feedback on uh, and what we want to base our product decisions on. So over the next several mo months, Mark, as you know, we'll have some exciting announcements about how SharePoint is getting integrated into Teams. We're all very excited about that. And I believe it will really um, help teachers and students and educational institutions. Yeah, I can see some of those things helping teachers especially when they've got a new class that they're starting and, of course, starting in Teams, mm -hmm. um, that first start experience, that first run experience. So it hopefully it'll give them a lot of tools to be able to start faster with a little bit more awareness of what they're starting with. So if we were to look over in the Teams world into the future, uh, anything recent that maybe needs some amplification or anything new or thoughts that you have for what's coming? 
Yeah. So one of the big things that we actually just released recently is, as I mentioned, Teams is all about being an open and extensible platform. And so that's where we also released the Share to Teams button that a number of our educational partners have integrated. So if we think about, say, uh, Kahoot or Flipgrid, you actually now have a button where you can say Share to Teams, and that will natively then bring that piece of content across. And you can even then assign it to students as an assignment. So that's just recently come out and would strongly encourage developers to integrate. I was just about to say, I just heard all the developers' ears open up and say, okay, Tell me again how I can program the send to button because mm-hmm. that's, so hu- that's huge. Just search share to teams um, as part of the Microsoft Docs. It's really only a few lines, super simple to implement, but incredibly powerful as to a also then to drive usage of your application in an educational scenario with teams. Um, and then one of the other big ones that's coming out very, very soon is integration with Turnitin. So one of the world's leading plagiarism checkers will then also again have deep integration as part of the assignment service. So that way you can make sure students are actually submitting work that is officially there. Um, So very, very powerful. And again, part of that commitment we have to education to really have those deep integrations with popular tools that we're hearing our educators requesting. And one of the other things that we're building within the product group is also an enhanced experience around assignments. So this is where we've seen a lot of asks for having a grade book. So giving me a singular place to be able to then see my student performance across the actual class itself. And so the grade book's coming very, very soon. So excited to have more people getting a chance to go hands-on with it. I love it. So really, really powerful. Um, And certainly the assignments has already been tremendously popular and we've continued to also actually refine and improve the user interface, which has just rolled out to, again, save time for teachers as part of then grading student work. And probably one last thing I'd love to finish with is speaking of saving time, it's not just saving time in grading assignments. Also, of course, then every single education customer gets the benefit that Teams is still an enterprise grade platform. So when we think about calling and video conferencing, you get all of those benefits Mm. in education. And so one example is Greenwood Academy Trust. So this is a school district in the UK. They actually saved over one and a half years of staff time by moving to Teams meetings rather than having say that everyone... one more time? How much time? They saved over one and a half years <laughs> worth of staff time by going to Teams online meetings for their staff meetings rather than driving between all of the different schools. And so it was incredibly powerful. They also saved a lot of money, as you can imagine, on travel expenses. Um, and overall actually saw a 20% reduction in the cost with in IT by moving to Office 365 and then having some of those organizational efficiencies like online teams meetings. Sure. And I bet morale for those teachers went pretty far up. Really, really far <laughs> up. Um, and there was actually a fantastic experience where I got to meet with a principal and she was using the praise feature in Teams. For those who haven't seen it, it's just a little option that you have from the message extensions where you can send someone praise saying, you know, great work, team player, creative thinker, and little things like that. Again, mm. it's how do we then build that team environment in a digital space just like we do in a physical space. I love it. I love it. I actually think I'm going to ask the Microsoft IT just to flip us over to the education skew for a second so I can send you both praise for being an excellent team player today. Perfect. So thank you, Deb Johnny. Uh, any way that people can follow you to find out more about what you're doing and certainly learn more about what we talked about today? You can find me on Twitter at uh, Debjani MI. So my first name and the first two letters of my last name. And for resources, you can just search for the SharePoint Help Center online and get all the great information about how to get started, data and lists, pages, sites, sharing, and lots more. As I also mentioned, we're working on that documentation to provide better clarity between OneDrive, SharePoint, and Teams, and that can be found on um, the Office Education Help Center. So go search for that as well. Excellent. We'll put it in the show notes. Um, Dominic, the best way for people to see what you're up to and, of course, what Teams for Education is all about. Where can they go to learn more? Yeah, so uh, connect with me on Twitter, Dominic Will IT. so D-O-M-I-N-I-C, Will IT. Uh, it's a great place where I share updates as they come out and certainly welcome questions if you have them when you're listening to the podcast today. Um, from a user point of view, I'd highly recommend go to education.microsoft.com. That's the Microsoft Education Center where we have then on-demand courses to help you getting started using Microsoft Teams, but also all of our education solutions that we have. So it's a fantastic community that also gives educators recognition through the innovative of Educator Program. And for our technical friends listening, of course, go to the Microsoft Docs website and then search Microsoft Teams. And that's where we have all of the details that you need for things like governance, setup, policy. It's all there for you as part of Docs. Awesome. I want to write my first share to button. I'm going to work on that. <laughs> that is there. <laughs> share to, and that's exactly where you can see the sample code. I'll, I'll go find it and I'll give it a try. So again, thank you for your time. Thanks for all that you're doing for the education space and have fun out there. Thanks so much. Thank Great to be you. part of it.
Up next, we'll talk to Alexander and Mats from Stockholm City Schools about how Microsoft technology helps them transform education in their classrooms in Sweden. So let's transition to actually hear from people who are not just thinking about education, not building the product for education, but actually using it and using it at scale. So we're going to take a moment here to talk to Alexander Strauss-Kohn and Mats Ostrom. They are tasked with making IT useful for users. They are experts in the education department from the Stockholm City Schools. Mats, Alexander, welcome to the IntraZone. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. We really want to start just to make clear for everybody and and for me to learn a little bit more about you. Who are you? What do you do for the city of Stockholm? Uh, And a little bit about what your title is. Yeah, my name is Alexander and uh, I'm working at the educational department as a product specialist for Microsoft 365 products with focusing on uh, how to use it the best way in the, the pedagogical workflow. Yeah, and my name is Mats, and uh, I'm a colleague to uh, Alexander. I work at the same department. I work with the SharePoint parts of Office uh, 365 and how the school can communicate with uh, the personnel, the students, and their parents. So if I paint a picture from what I understand, you all support about 140,000 students, about 25,000 teachers, and this is all from one tenant. And it spans about 700 nursery schools, 140 middle schools, and eight education establishments. And my first question to you is, first of all, I, I should say congratulations. That's an amazing task in a single tenant. But how do you do that, um, not only the IT side of it, but like you said, the pedagogical side at scale for the whole Stockholm City Schools? Yeah, sure. It has been a challenge uh, since there isn't a one solution that fits all. So you have different needs across the from nursery schools up to adult education. So we need to listen to what the needs of the um, of the different uh, school types. What do they need? What do the teachers need? What do, do the students need? And uh, we just try to be as uh, inclusive in every part of their needs. So it is a challenge. Yeah, uh, to to listen to them and try to point out to some places, well, you're actually doing the same thing here, but in a different ways. Can you do it this way? And then try to come up to a, a solution that fits most of them. <laughs> <laughs> and part of your design is that not one size fits all. There isn't just one single team site template. There's not one single way that people share their files and or collect files as a teacher. But how would you describe how you've managed that flexibility given the teachers, the students, everything that they need? And that could vary, you know, across the different schools, the different principals. How do you manage the level of difference balanced with your ability to still manage and support them? Yeah, I mean, basically, we give them a platform that should support about, uh, what do you say, like 80% of their needs. And if there are schools with a, a special idea, they are available to get admin roles so they can explore their pedagogical needs. So we support, we don't shut it all down, but we provide a basic platform for everybody. Security always comes first. Uh, I mean, it's always important that uh, our children and our parents uh, to children feel safe in the digital environment. So security is a big issue for us, of course. What is the youngest person in the Stockholm City Schools that's using Microsoft 365? In the nursery school, there are only the teachers that have an account. So basically, it's from class zero, as we call it, and that's from six years old. The student gets their new uh, Office 365 account. So if a student starts at that age, and then they are with you through possibly the adult education, um, you know, if, if what you shared as the math, that's possibly 15 years that people are within the same tenant, that's the tech side, but really are with you in a support role in, in guiding them how to use technology for the best of their school advantage. And for a family that has multiple children, what does that look like? I mean, basically, one of the props with having a school platform as we have it is that the parents are meeting the same system 
throughout the, all the years they have children in the public schools here in Stockholm. So I think that is a great beneficial because they don't need to relearn how the system is working. So hopefully that will be a great effect on communication between parents and schools. It sounds like it. And I think that's one of the things that I, I wanted to talk about next was, you know, you had mentioned that you had created a number of SharePoint based landing pages that are meant to be both for people who are in the system, the students and teachers and principals, and of course, the parents who have, are in the system, but aren't necessarily able to access it in the same way. So can we just dive into how you've built these, I think, the two important SharePoint landing pages. Maybe first we can talk about the one for students, and then we can talk about the one for parents. Yeah. We built a SharePoint uh, landing page for students and teachers and personnel in school, in which they, when they log on, they land, and there we have... Um, that page is fixed. They can't do anything with it. It's just showing information from other parts of the whole platform and links back to the platform. I usually say my goal is to make them stay as short time as possible on the landing page because we're going to move them on, <laughs> so to speak. But the purpose is to get a picture of this is my school day for the students and the teachers. This is what's going to happen today. So we're aiming for getting the schedule there, news from schools and the SharePoint pages from the teams and other SharePoint pages in the platform and a little information from the other systems in the platform, which is not Office 365. So that's the main purpose with the landing page for the students and the teachers. And we try to use as much out-of-the-box features as possible. So we're using the news web part that it's out-of-the-box, but we had to build a calendar web part to show the students and the teachers a cal Outlook calendar and a landing page and uh, some web parts that shows different calendars. That's the landing page for the students. And the parents, we had to find another solution because how they are also interested in a lot of information from the whole platform and from Office 365. So we took another SharePoint, uh, which is on-prem in the city, and built a landing page for them to which we extract information from Office 365 and show the parents. All the news that the teachers are getting on their landing page, we are reflecting on um, or showing the parents as well. So we just get the news and show them to them. Even the schedule, we will pull out and show them and some um, notifications from other systems in uh, the platform, not from the O365. The technical part of <laughs> my colleagues, they said we can't extract the notifications from the, the 365 system. It's locked inside. <laughs> ah. Yeah, that's so, a little bit of a user problem. <laughs> yeah, well, but it sounds like to me, Outside of, you know, you're always going to come across a few shortcomings or, or issues that you need to work through, that you're really leveraging SharePoint both on premises and in the cloud for the best of the ability to extract the information, to showcase it, and to keep it private. You know, I'm assuming when a parent signs in, they're only seeing what they're allowed to see. And a lot of that is, you know, you're pulling the data from Office 365 to then show it in that on premises landing page. But it also realizes which parent is signed in, what they have access to view. And then certainly when the, the teachers and the students sign into their landing page, you get that same, you know, relevant personalized experience. And, and again, back to GDPR, because you have to, and I think from a technical side, because you can. Yeah, that was, uh, we started this before the GDPR, because it's one of the main goals. You're only going to see what you need to see. Right, right. <laughs> and you have the right to see. I can just go to myself as a parent. Why should I see a lot of information that is not for me? Yeah. So why show information that's not for you? 
it, to me, before we talked just a, b- ahead of time, you know, I knew the definition of GDPR. I knew that typically when you speak with somebody from Europe, especially in the education system, there is a different level of privacy. That's not to say that other parts of the world don't think of this information as private, but there's a little next level of compliance. And it's great to hear how you've approached it and obviously that it's in production and it works for all these these different types of personas that are interacting with your system. And I'll just uh, selfishly say at Microsoft, it's a it's a pleasure to hear not only that you're finding great value and all these different people are able to interact with the system, but it means that it actually truly does meet the level of your requirements that may or may not be higher or lower than another customer or another education department. But the reality is, is it is, uh, of course, GDPR compliant. We know that. That's something that we had to certify. But to hear it in practice at least tells me that it really does, in practice, over time, meet that goal. Yeah, it does. So one of the things that you had told me about the landing pages that I think is really fun, but I also think is really interesting to hear how you implemented it, is the most important question that both parents and students are asking themselves every day. And that question yeah. is, with the grumble, you, you are all already <laughs> past lunchtime, but I'm staring at maybe grabbing lunch soon. What is yeah. for lunch? What's for lunch? What is for lunch today? Um, how did you approach answering that question on these landing pages? Yeah, we had to have a broad approach because some schools already had a solution and other schools had another solution and some had none solution, so to speak. So we had to make uh, about three different solutions. We created a list and a web part that extracted that list and showed it nicely. This is the food for today. And the list, we had to make it user-friendly so it's easy. What's for lunch on Monday and up to three or five or six different dishes and so on. And then other people are using third-party uh, technology that's open on the internet. We had to pull in and show up. So we some are using some RSS technology and some are just using Google calendars, which we are also, and we will uh, using. So we're trying to show <laughs> show them up. So, that, so the schools don't have to write the same information in several different places. Right. So if they are using a Google calendar, use it and tell us, just which solution are you using so we can extract it for the parents' landing page? I can only imagine across all of the different schools, the different ways that people had thought to implement or maybe they you know, transformed into using more Microsoft 365 or blending what they had already been using. But it really is that end goal of being able to pull disparate information from wherever it is into a meaningful contextual page or experience. Yes. And the thing I thought was fascinating about the lunch list, you know, what's what's for lunch today? It's a pretty easy question. Um, but to make it right up front, because you get it as a common request, and for the most part, you're for each school creating a single list that gets consumed to the cloud where your students and teachers sign in and to that on-premises system. But it's the same list. It's the same source. So at least you're you're serving out, for lack of a better way to describe lunch, you're serving lunch in the same way. Yeah, that's a good that's a good way to say it. So let's transition to talk a little bit more about how people work together, specifically between teachers and students. And one reminder, I think, just at this point, and it's more of a reminder to myself that the work that you're both doing, you're doing these landing pages for every school. This is not just one page for all schools. It's an individual page for each school, right? Yeah, it's uh, we have this landing page uh, for each individual right so with these web parts so the landing page is just one page so to speak but the web parts shows the different let's make it personal because you're getting information from your parts where, where you are a member in office 365 so the information differs but it's the same site for everyone the landing page and then we have uh, every school has their own sharepoint site in which they can publish news and uh, what's for lunch today. <laughs> That's where the source is on the school page, because uh, that and um, where they have a calendar for important dates for that specific school. So we created a page for each school, which is kind of an intranet for every school. So 
teachers, students and parents have access to that information on that page. And this is where I think it's interesting on who you delegate that control to, yeah. or at least to make the configuration what's right for my school. Because you, yeah. you, you delegate that to the principal, correct? Yeah, the principal uh, is the one who's uh, responsible for the information. So we delegate that to the principal to tell us who will have that right to rearrange that <laughs> my school page to administrate. We have two roles, one admin role and one writer role, because we realize that just because you're good at administrating, administrate a web page, that doesn't mean you're good at writing. And if you're good at writing, it doesn't mean you're. So we had to make it two different roles. And that's actually an area that you've touched on where a lot of people, when they think about moving to the cloud, they think of either one person has to do a lot more or it's yeah. very distinct at the tenant level, the workload level, and then after that it gets a little fuzzy. But the reality is, especially with SharePoint, you know, when you think of a site, we think of it as a site collection, you can still give ownership at that level but still maintain a parent role to govern or to do things that are more accessible to, across schools. But at the school level, you are making them as autonomous as possible. Yeah. I think that's one of the success uh, with it, giving them a basic site to uh, start work with. And if they're not interested in developing, they can manage and go with that basic level. But if they want to explore and rebuild it and do whatever they want with it to adapt it to their school. Well, I hope in the future that I come across somebody at Ignite from Stockholm City Schools who is a principal, who's just there to learn how to do SharePoint more, how to use SharePoint more. I would love that. <laughs> yeah, I would love that too. <laughs> and usually, often they um, delegate it to an administrator role. Of course, because, of course. But uh, it's important that you have an engaged principal who thinks this is important and understand that information uh, communication is important. <laughs> I sure hope so. And I, from, again, what I hear that you're giving them the tools to then use, it sounds like they're using it. Yeah. One of the other tools that I know you, that you use, which is usually typically more around collaboration, is you're using Microsoft Teams and you're doing this really across all schools and giving them, again, that autonomy to enable the different people that can create the teams, but a lot of people are active in the teams. Can you give us a, a view or a summary into how across the Stockholm City Schools, you're leveraging Microsoft Teams and, and the different people involved? Yeah, sure. We are uh, having a, using a, uh, your product, the School Data Sync, so we can uh, automatically create teams from uh, our school information system, which is uh, classes and courses. So our school information system is the main source of information. But we also have the ability to uh, let the schools create uh, manual teams, so uh, if they have needs between teacher and teacher or so on, or different teachers, or sorry, teachers in different schools need to create a team, they can. And that is also an administrative role to create a Office 365 group and a SharePoint site. So that's also up to the principals to decide how many Office 365 group creation admin roles do I need on my school and what is our needs. So... They should be good enough with the automatic uh, created teams, but we don't want to hold anyone back. So if they are needed, can create manual teams and SharePoint sites, of course. Of course. Thank you for throwing that plug in. If you were to look at, you know, if you've enabled them with the Microsoft Teams in a way that they can then roll them out or, or give them to whom needs it, how would you define their use case, you know, of the different features. I know that there's a lot of scenarios around turning assignments in. There's the ability for the teachers to grade the content. There's the notion of quiet hours, announcements, and building things with templates. But how do you actually see the students and teachers leveraging Teams? What is it that they do with it? The big plus side with Teams for Education, uh, as we talk about, is, of course, uh, the assignments function that saves the teachers a lot of time and that they can follow the students' work during or before the due date. And then, of course, we have the class notebook that is also a great feature in Teams. So those two are basically 
the best uh, appreciated functions in Teams. But I mean, it's also a, a different way of learning because you can also use the channels to structure your work in this classroom or in a course. And the Teams also gives the students the ability to show what they need, to show their knowledge to the teacher in a different way. Because if a teacher puts a question in a, a channel, every student can answer the question. If a teacher just throws the question out in a classroom, possibly two students can answer the question. So if we are using Teams as uh, quick questions, every student can get their knowledge shown to the teacher. So I think that is also a great educational aspect of Teams. Well, you just gave me a great visual that may or not be 100% true in how I'm thinking about it. But if the teacher is either asking a question or enabling a channel for people to ask questions, you know, there's the uh, raise your hand being called on and providing an answer. That's a pretty standard way that might be, you know, sort of frightful for a lot of students. It might not be where their strength is to verbalize what they have in their head. But if they can see what other people have answered in writing, or if for them they can take a moment to write out an answer and think about it, and of course review what other people have said, and maybe even just to review the question. What was the question? I don't remember that. I'm just yeah. thinking there's such a visual component to this learning and a much more open way of sharing, especially for people who either learn differently or uh, are able to you know provide their answers in a in a different kind of way versus just answering a question if they got called on. Yeah, and you also get a, more of a learning community because a question doesn't always have to be answered by the teacher. I mean, the question can also be answered by another student. Right. So you get a collective learning instead of just a teacher-student learning. Yeah, and I can tell you how many times when I was in school, I couldn't raise my hand and hyperlink to a really important resource. I couldn't raise my hand and add an image, you know, that just came to mind. So it's a real rich palette. I'm interested in when people are working on files and assuming in an education space they're working on different papers, either on their own, with other people. How do you see that in the Stockholm City Schools, people leveraging, sharing their work, working on different files, creating them in the first place? How are people working on files and sharing their work? I would say, since basically with Office 365, you can go mobile, so you can work everywhere. And the students and the teachers are just exploring that, I think. So they're creating a lot of files, and they're creating a lot of files on their home computers or making movies on their mobile phones and so on, and just upload it to their OneDrive. As a student, you can be more creative when you are working on an assignment. It's more flexible both for the teachers and for the students, since as a teacher you have a private life and uh, you don't always have the same working hours as everybody else. So you need to get access your material or go through student work at the evening or something like that. And that's working fine with Office 365. And that didn't work so fine before, <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. so to speak. Yeah. yeah. From the way that I've heard you describe, obviously, that and really most everything that we've talked about, you're very mindful in your approach about, obviously, leveraging the technology, listening to all the needs, and then just being aware of, well, how are actually people using it? And maybe even thinking when something comes out, like you said, you may not release it immediately to everybody, but you're probably going to evaluate, not is it just GDPR compliant, but is it actually useful? And maybe it'll even enable people to work differently or in a way that makes their overall experience better. Before we jump too far out of OneDrive, I would love for you to just share with everybody the growth that you've seen in OneDrive. When you think about where you started, and maybe you can tell us about how long you know the, the schools have been in the system, and where you are at now, just the pure scale. Yeah, sure. We implemented uh, or started to implement Office 365 on a broad scale last school year. And uh, then we started with four terabytes of storage in OneDrive in our tenant. And this school year, we started with 21 terabytes in OneDrive. So it has uh, <laughs> grown uh, quite a bit. Yep. I want to thank you for your time today. I certainly appreciate you sharing the story of what the city of Stockholm is doing for education and, of course, at scale and your approach and your awareness to what everybody is doing in the system to be flexible with what they need. So thank you for your time today. Yeah, thank you thank very you. much.
So it's that point in the episode where we tap further into the brains of all the subject matter experts that we've talked to to get from them answers to their most frequently asked questions. And sometimes these are exactly on topic. Sometimes these are just what they get questions about, whether it's on or off topic. So Alexander, we'll start with you. What is a frequent question that you're getting and how do you answer it? Yeah, one of my frequent questions is from teachers who have missing their automatically created teams. So they have suddenly disappeared. And then I have to ask them is, has another teacher who is also an owner of the team accidentally hit the delete instead of leave the team? Interesting. So maybe the feedback to us is don't put those buttons too close together. I know they aren't. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so it basically, it's basically it's an educational uh, <laughs> question for us here to educate our teachers. Uh, I think it's a good, it's a great thing to not only be able to educate them for it to not happen again, but also yeah. that you can recover from it. So it's not the end of the world, yeah. right? Exactly. Gotcha. Exactly. But it's a big support feature. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's good that you still have this job and you can still support them. That's a that's a good thing. Yeah. Matt, what is your most frequently asked question these days? Yeah, it's actually from uh, parents, I would say, um, because we have, um, and it's, uh, why do I see this uh, personal information about other parents on this site? Because we built a site with a contact information uh, to other parents, which is only only seen to if the parent themselves have allowed it by pushing a button. The question is, why do I see the phone number to that parent, I don't know, the child. <laughs> and the answer is, well, that parent has allowed to show the phone number to all the parents in all the groups that your child is in school. And in some group, your children is in the same group. <laughs> gotcha. So it is an opt-in. So if somebody yeah. didn't want to share their phone number, then people would never see it. That's the default. Gotcha. In my role, one of the most common questions that I get is, what is the difference between the enterprise offering and the education offering? And certainly one started before the other. We had enterprise before we offered to education. And so a part of my role used to be to talk about the gaps. What were some features that weren't available for education? Or because GDPR started to become important, there were certain things that for a little while we turned off. So the list is very short and very small. Um, and it actually is now traversed to flip in the sense that if somebody were to ask me the question today, what are the, what are the differences between enterprise and education, I often spend more time telling them what education gets that enterprise doesn't. And we talked about a big one, the teams for education. There's a lot of other things in terms of, the, you know, from a planner perspective or templating. There's a lot that obviously uh, from a partner perspective that's offered. Um, but the real answer is there isn't a big difference between enterprise and education, especially for the workload that I own the most, which is SharePoint, uh, and of course, working with OneDrive teams. Uh, so it's a good answer, uh, but oftentimes it's just clarity of I'm in the education space. I've been given an education tenant in Office 365, how different it is. Uh, and, and the good answer is it's not that, that it's not that different. Sometimes it's even more unique with better features or more targeted for them. Dominic, you must get lots of questions we can gather about what, but what is your most frequently asked question? So one of the questions I get asked a lot is, particularly if when you think about further and higher education, should students be able to self-create their own teams? And the answer is yes, because when we think about teams, of course, it's part of Office 365. So we have all of the governance tools that we need to allow students to be able to self-create teams and then automate the governance behind the scenes. And so people say to me, well, what happens if they use bad language in the title? Fear not. This is where we have naming policy. So you can make sure it doesn't need to then have any sort of incorrect naming format or incorrect language that you might not want as a part of a team name. And we have then policies like expiration policy, which again means that teams over time and if they're not being used, are removed from your environment. But one of the big benefits about this is then empowering students to start developing job-ready skills. Imagine you're in a tutorial and you need to get some work done. The ability to be able to say, all right, 
the four of us here together today, we need to team up, get our project started. Imagine the opposite scenario where, okay, the four of us together today need to wait maybe a couple of days. A team might have eventually appear. We're already starting on the back foot. And we're mm. probably just going to go and use a tool that's not supported by our institution if we have to wait for it. So this is where it's super important to empower students. And absolutely, we have the governance. We have the security tools behind the scenes to help automate to make sure that you, from a governance point of view, are protected while your students are empowered to work and learn together. So that's my most frequently asked question. But if you have questions or wondering where to even get started, just click on the help button in Teams. So if you're on your laptop or in the browser, bottom left-hand side, click the help button. You've got built-in training videos from the training option or also, and we would love to hear from you, click on the suggest a feature. You know, we're really open and we love feedback. So that help button is where you can bring it all together. And we heard at scale with the Stockholm City Schools, they're doing just that. They're enabling the right people. It doesn't have to mean you enable everybody, but you enable the people that you want with the balance of you can control and manage very easily. Exactly. Excellent. Deb Johnny, your most frequently asked question recently. Yeah, here's a frequently asked question that I get from um, IT people that work in educational institutions is, can my SharePoint sites reflect the school colors? And the answer is a resounding yes. Absolutely. Um, you can use the SharePoint theme designer to sort of easily set up a theme that's based on your school colors and then import that right into SharePoint. And the really great thing about the theme designer is that it also tells you about your accessibility contrast ratio. So you can ensure you have a site theme based on your school colors that's loved by all. Very nice. And Chris, last but not least, what is your most frequently asked question this week? Well, I'm going to substitute um, favorite from frequently, since this is one I've only been asked twice, but I've been asked at conferences at the end of keynotes. And the question is, my school uses non-Microsoft technologies, but I like using Microsoft technologies. Is there any way that I can interact with some of those other suites? And the question, to be fair, since this is sort of her episode, has come from my daughter Rachel twice when she has <laughs> dropped in on things. That's one of my things that I'm aware of is that if you were using some of these other suites, you can still submit your Word docs or your PowerPoints into those repositories. And if you need to convert to other formats, there are capabilities right there. So we want to make sure that not just the educational technology is adaptive and responsive to different devices and different student needs, but also the technology is responsive to different formats as well. Obviously, at Microsoft, we think our technology might be 2% better than some of the other technologies 2%. out there. Chris. 5%. 1%. <laughs> but we recognize it's the same way we see in the commercial space. There's different needs, and we want to make sure that we support interoperability. Yeah, I think, you know, certainly from a developer's perspective, there's opportunities, you know, interoperability across clouds is a given, a must. But the reality of, you know, when you have people that are comfortable or handed certain things, you know, you want to make sure that uh, anything can be incorporated and, and it should be achievable without having to force change. So I think that's a great question. Thank you. So thank you for your FAQs. And again, thanks for your time on the IntraZone. It was great to be here. Fantastic to be part of it. Thanks for being invited. So let's turn our attention to events. We don't want you to leave this podcast ever without knowing what's right around the corner or with a little bit of a longer lens, what might be coming up in a few months that you'd want to plan for. So let's start with SharePoint Saturdays. Chris was recently at the SharePoint Saturday New England, and I think you were the the lone wolf at the end at the AMA. I don't know what else you did during the, the Saturday, but I think I saw a picture of you going, that's a lot of questions. <laughs> did you get some good questions? There were a lot of good questions, and it's really encouraging when I look go to these events and get to look around the speaker room and realize half the speakers I know quite well, and the other half are people who are brand new. And we see the same thing with the attendees. And so if you are new to this space, understand that these things, SharePoint Saturdays in particular, they're for everyone. And you should find one that's coming up. And fortunately, there is always one that's coming up. On October 19th, a two for Brussels in Belgium. You can find more information on Twitter at B-I-W-U-G. And in Kansas City, Kansas. Oh, yeah. Click your heels. You'll get to the SharePoint Saturday. No problem. So if you are not going to Brussels or Kansas City, but you find yourself in Sydney, Australia on October 26th, there is a SharePoint Saturday for you, mate. You can go to SharePoint Saturday. You should know about all of these is that they are free 
And like Chris was noting, it really is for everybody. You'll find content for business users, for IT, for developers, and you get always a great set of speakers. And they're really well run. You know, you show up and they are organized. These are a nice day-long event, plug in, meet a lot of people, network, get into the SharePoint Saturday, easy to get in, get out, and uh, feel very accomplished for your weekend. If you're not going to be in Orlando, don't worry. There's plenty of ways for you to engage with our content online. We'll be live streaming the keynotes throughout the week as well as most of the key sessions so you can participate as if you were there. And following on that, Mark, if you go to Microsoft.com slash Ignite, we can get details on... Yeah, you can find out about both Ignite, the show, and everything that's live streaming, and of course, everything that trickles off the main event. But you can also plug into Ignite, the tour, which will be at 30 cities around the world starting shortly after Ignite. So Ignite's in November, but they also have all the cities listed into 2020, the first half. So find a city near you, and essentially, you're going to be getting a lot of that same content. Chris and I, as content owners own sessions at the tour to make sure that it's good content, good demos, and, of course, prep the speakers so they know, you know, some of the tough questions. And the first Ignite the Tour City actually kicks off the week after Main Ignite, and that is uh, November 13th to 14th in Paris. En Paris. I have somehow found it in my heart to travel there. <laughs> so as Chris is getting comfortable with a croissant and potentially un peu de vin, there's another event on that side of the pond, the European SharePoint Conference. This will be in Prague, Czech Republic, December 2nd through the 5th. There are a ton of keynotes, inclusive of our favorite friend, Jeff Teeper, but a lot across the spectrum of everything that Microsoft has to offer with leaders from the Windows division, Azure, and a special keynote with Vesa Yvonen, who's going to be talking about all things office development. This is four days of content, 150-plus sessions across all levels and all personas of what you can learn there. Go to SharePointEurope.com or on Twitter at EuropeanSP. Great content, great team behind it, guaranteed to be a great event. Thank you to our guests, Dominic Williamson and Debjani Mitra from Microsoft, and Alexander Strauss-Kohn and Mats Ostrom from Stockholm City Schools in Sweden. Check out our show page for links to everything we discussed today and more. Go to aka.ms slash the intrazone. Send us your questions or feedback for the SharePoint engineering and product teams. You can email us at theintrazone at microsoft.com or share your thoughts through Twitter with at SharePoint, at mcashman, and at cmcnulty2000. Tell all your friends and colleagues about the show and help share the Microsoft 365 love. Subscribe down at your local schoolyard or wherever <laughs> you get your podcasts. Absolutely. I'm, I'm going to look for our podcast when I take my kids to school next. Thanks again. Thank you for listening. We are your hosts, Mark Cashman and Chris McNulty. You've been listening to The Interzone, a very educational show about the Microsoft 365 Intelligent Internet. Intranet.